So thank you for joining us today. We are going to be talking about Global Mapper and Global Mapper Mobile and how we can um, manage and share data between the two applications. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this webinar format, uh, you will be in listen-only mode today, but as some of you have seen, will have the ability to um, send us questions in the questions panel. Um, Amanda and I will do our absolute best to answer those live, but if we can't, we will be following up um, afterwards via email. And I think Amanda, these all get put uh, into a blog as well, correct? Correct. They'll be posted on the website with both a question and a full answer. Great. So we will do our best to get you answers to all of your questions. For those of you who attend our GeoTalks Express sessions regularly, we have two more um, coming up this year before we start to wind down for the holiday season and end of year. On November 10th, we have an exciting um, Global Mapper Pro Geotox Express where we're going to have a live uh, user review. So Patrick Cunningham, our CEO, will be there, as will David McKittrick, who you should know from many of these other talks, uh, along with Mike Childs, who was the original developer um, of, of Global Mapper. And they're going to be joined by a handful of uh, Global Mapper users to discuss the Global Mapper Pro application. And then on November 17th, there will be a Geotox Express focusing on um, suitability analysis and viticulture. And so for me, as someone who lives in the wine region of central New York, um, I'm looking forward to that talk, but you know, your suitability analysis can be provided to a variety of workflows. So please look out for that as well. We do have two more public training sessions coming up before the end of the year. Um, both of those will be next month. Um, starting November, the very first week, we're going to have a um, global mapper focused session the first week, and that's going to cover all the non-LIDAR analysis tools within global mapper. The following week, we will have a LIDAR focused course um, I'll actually be teaching that course, uh, November 8th to 10th, uh, and I believe, I think, Amanda, you may be joining me for that. Is that is that right? I am, yeah. Okay, great. So if you would like to come to either of those sessions, they should still be open, and you can find um, them on our website where you can sign up as well. Uh, it's worth noting, both of those sessions are going to introduce um, new tools added to Global Mapper Pro that was released uh, a couple months ago. And so, um, you know, rather than splitting uh, the training sessions between pro and non-pro, um, we're doing so where everybody will get exposed to pro tools, some of which will be global mapper side and some of which will be LIDAR specific processing, since that may depend a little bit based on your workflows. But okay, let's get into things today. So Amanda and I, as I had mentioned, are going to discuss um, how a data manager in an office would work to send data to their field users and Global Mapper Mobile. So today, Amanda is going to be the data manager um, and prep all of the data in the office before sending it to me in the field. While she and I are not, in fact, in the same location, um, I, of course, am not outside right now. So we're going to pretend a little um, on that side of things, and hopefully I will be able um, to get a GPS signal inside so I can show us some um, location-based functionality and how we can save some of that information. So our goal is going to be to walk through kind of what Amanda will do as the data manager to ensure data integrity, um, and then share that with me, the field user, um, who can then work with the data following all the guidelines that Amanda sent me um, before I save my work and send it back to the office. Um, 
so Amanda, if you're ready to go, I can give you the screen and let I'm you ready. start us off in Global Mapper. Alrighty, so you should be able to see Global Mapper here. And so for this example, as a data manager in this hypothetical situation that we have running here today, I'm pretending that we're going to do a tree inventory analysis for the city. So basically my pretend goal is to send Jeff out into the field to collect GPS um, information about trees that are in this area and send it back to me. There are two parts of this. One part is setting up some data to send to Jeff, um, like the imagery you see here. And this will help give Jeff in his um, in his mobile device a little bit of perspective on where he is and um, where the data he needs to collect is. And then the second part of this that we'll cover soon is creating um, a worksheet basically, a, a list of things for Jeff to collect while he's out in the field. And this will help make sure that the data he collects fits a certain fits a certain set of criteria and if especially if you're sending it out to a team of people, this will um, it'll make the data collection more efficient and much more easy to manage here in the office. So to start, in Global Mapper Desktop, I just have loaded here. Um, Amanda, an NAI... we may not be seeing your screen. It says you're seeing my screen. Could very well be be a me issue. Um, you're right, I am. Sorry for interrupting you. Okay, it's all good. I'm I'm glad we checked through these things. <laughs> Okay, so we have, an, we have an imagery layer here, and also on top of that, I have a parcels layer. And then I'm gonna go ahead and drag in another road shape file so we can have that information as well. And we notice, you can notice while looking at this that the parcels and the roads are a little bit difficult to distinguish from the imagery underneath it. And that's a problem that would probably be worse um, once the data gets sent out into the field and you're looking at a screen in the sun. So what I'm gonna do before, before we get into things too far is I'm gonna change some of the symbology to make these items easier to see. Now, I'm gonna take a moment here to, to stop and apologize there. I know that there are some users here that aren't very familiar with Global Mapper Desktop. And because this is a mobile webinar, I'm gonna, I'm probably going to end up skipping over and avoiding some of the more in-depth instructions on how to do these things. But, but do not despair. We have plenty of other um, YouTube videos and tutorials and demonstrations on how, how to handle all of the functionality within Global Mapper. And if you have any questions, feel free to send them in. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna double click on the roads layer to open vector options. And there are a few different ways to change the symbology, but for this one, I'm going to go change the feature type from unknown line type, which is the default, to another one of the built-in line types, which is what I'm gonna to choose today is arterial road. May not necessarily fit the definition of what roads we're looking at, but I like how distinct the green is from the rest of the imagery. And now the parcel layers, as we mentioned earlier, are very difficult to see and because we're working for the city of Rochester in this example we're not so interested in the individual properties we only want to look at the roads um, the schools and maybe this park over here just the, just the land that's owned by the city so to kind of highlight those city owned properties I'm going to come into the vector options and I'm going to click on area styles and then I'm going to choose the option here to apply styling based on attribute and name of values and there's an attribute in here that I created previously, though there are plenty of attributes that would also work. It's owned by, that'll show the properties that are owned, basically um, private or not private. So I've chosen that attribute. I'm gonna click load values, and this would pull in all of the values that are included in that attribute. In this case, there's just the one. And to change the style, I'm gonna select the attribute, or the value, and click edit style. And for this, I wanna give it a solid fill, black is fine, and then a solid line, but we don't necessarily want to get rid of all of the, the private land information. We still kind of want to see it. So I'm going to change the transparency, lower it to about 50%. I'm going to click OK, add it. And now we can see that the streets and the school and um, this Parker Cemetery over here are now highlighted and easier to see. And it'll be much more easier for Jeff and the field team to focus on these out in the field. It is worth mentioning that you don't have to have this information to send out um, a GMMP or a Global Map or Mobile Packet Fire out into the field. I could just send um, Jeff a big box that says collect data in this area and send them out and he could do that without any of this information. But adding some of this background um, parcels and roads and I imagery especially is very useful for, for adding context to what you're gathering in the field. So next, 
to create the form that Jeff is going to fill out, I'm going to create what's called a feature template. And to do that, I'm going to open the configuration options here. And in configuration options down near the bottom, there's the option called feature templates. And this loads all of the feature templates I've ever created. It is saved as a part of Global Mapper, but not necessarily part of the layer. And you can create feature templates from scratch down here as point line or area um, features or templates. Those aren't really distinguishable, so you want to make sure um, those are very distinguishable, so you want to make sure if you're collecting different feature types to make a template for the feature type that you're collecting. Now, to kind of fit our, our running example in Blue Marble here as a baking show where I have all of the ingredients here and I'll show you how to bake it and then I'll pull a finished product out from under the table, right? So for this example, I have a tree inventory feature type template here that, that I've already been created that we can look at, look at the ingredients and edit a little bit. So with this pre-existing template selected, I'm going to come down to the bottom and hit edit. And here we can see everything that makes a feature template. You can see its feature name, um, a brief description, and you can also set the symbology. So the, there's a whole list of built-in default symbology or, or feature types that you can use within Global Mapper, but you can also create your own also within the configuration dialog. But for this one, although the default is um, unknown point feature, I've set it to tree since we're classifying trees. So every time Jeff GPSs or creates a tree point feature, it'll create a little green um, tree symbology on the map. Also included with this is probably the most important part are the attributes that are going to be collected. So when he creates a point, it'll prompt him with the attributes that I've listed here. And you can also prompt the user not only to include the species, but you can give them a list. So if I click on species, um, a, a value that I've already created, and hit edit, you can see that there's an attribute name, and then there's a list of some of the attributes or some of the values that he could select. But because by no means this, this isn't a, a, a full expansion of the different types of trees that he could encounter, I've left this as value editable. And this means that if global or if Jeff encounters a tree type that isn't on this list, he can go ahead and edit one of the existing values or add a new one to, to fill in that value. And the second option here is value input required. And this means that he cannot create that point without adding these attributes. So there are a few different types of attributes that you can create. There's a single value. We'll go ahead and create one here. So something that foresters frequently um, collect is the diameter at base height, or the DBH of the tree. And there are a few different data types that you can choose or that you can limit your data collectors to. There's string, which is basically a collect all, or there's integer, which is numbers. So because we're collecting um, diameter at base height, I'm going to choose the option to, for integer, because I only want Jeff or the data team to, to be able to type in numbers. I'm going to leave it as value editable. And because this, is, this, this range is going to, this value is going to range widely, I'll go ahead and leave it as editable and I'll leave it as value input required. I've been corrected. Diameter at breast height, not base. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. And then another option that we can do. So if you saw on DBH, it was a single value, so I could only add one option. But you can also choose the option to add an enumerated value here. And what this means is that you can add a whole list of different values for the, the team to choose from. So for this, I'm going to ask, is the tree alive? Because if the tree is not alive, it's considered a hazard, and that's um, a very important thing to know in a tree inventory analysis. So we have the attribute name, the data type will be string because it's text, and then I'm going to add some attributes. So one of the attributes that I'm going to add is yes. And because I'm going to assume that this will be the most common answer, I'm gonna go ahead and check this box to use this as the default value. So when it prompts Jeff to answer this attribute, is it alive? It'll go ahead and have the yes pulled up and he can just click okay. And that'll having a default value will save him a few clicks. The next value I'm going to add is another one, in case it isn't alive. I'm going to say, please describe. And because that value is editable, Jeff will be able to click on it and describe how it isn't quite alive or if it is a hazard or not. And once you've created all of these, you can see them here. Um, all of them are required, except the evidence of brown tail moth, as that may not be um, important for a lot of the trees we look at. Once you have all the settings set, you can click OK, and it saves it within your feature templates list. Now, as it is, it's just a template. It's not actually a part of your workspace to be exported, but you can add it by selecting this here and going down to create an empty template layer. 
it'll ask you to give it a name and then you can click OK and it adds it as a blank attribute table to Global Mapper. So I'll close this and we can expand, expand the template layers down to see our tree inventory. And if you open up get the attribute table here, you can see that it's completely blank. And this is the only way you can get an empty attribute table in Global Mapper is to load a feature template. So now that we have all of the data collected in one place that we want to send out to Jeff, we want to export it to him. And to do that, we're going to export it as a Global Mapper mobile package file, because that's what Global Mapper mobile, the app, will read. So it's a built -in, there's a built-in way to do this. You can go to File, Export, in Global Mapper mobile file. Now within this, there's a whole list of different options that you can choose. Um, you can set the export bounds to show how much data um, to export. From here, I'm just going to choose the option to export all data visible on screen. So that's just going to show, it's just going, it's just going to export what you can see here in the workspace. You can also choose to tile it if you're exporting a lot of data or especially a lot of imagery. Instead of exporting it as one very large file, you can tile it into multiple smaller tiles. You can also choose to simplify it, which will bring down some of, some of the quality, but it'll create smaller files. And then there are a few package options here. Now for projection, not all projection information is included in Global Mapper Mobile. So this option allows you to retain a given projection that isn't geographic latitude and longitude within the bounds of your exported file. So the default option is the state plane coordinate system projection, which is what I have loaded here as part of my workspace. But you can also choose the geographic latitude and longitude. You can also choose um, your export zoom options. Choosing a good zoom level automatically is usually the best way to go, and that's a default, but you can choose other zoom options as well. And basically, this is referring to when your field team opens up the package file within Global Mapper Mobile, at what zoom level do you want them to see the data at? And there are a few more options down here, but the two we'll want to pay most attention to today is the option to always maintain feature styles, even if using defaults. So that means over here, the, the roads and the parcel feature styles that we changed will be exported. But to save space, you can uncheck that option and it would just um, refer back to defaults. And the sec second option we'll want to look at is to include the thumbnail image for Global Mapper Mobile Display. And Jeff will show you this in the mobile app itself, but it's basically a screenshot when you pull up the file to help show you what's in, in, in the database. Are there any questions before I hit OK to export? It does look like we have one, Amanda. Let me pop it open so I can fully see it. Oh. Uh, so it's a good one. Um, are state plane and lat long the only options for coordinate systems in Global Mapper? Um, mobile? And the answer to that is no. Um, so the app itself has a handful of built-in coordinate systems that it supports, and I can show that here when, when I take over the screen. Um, but you could retain anything that um, is supported in Global Mapper. So Amanda happens to be working in State Plane right now, but maybe she was working in a UTM system or you know, and any other system. As long as she chooses that top option when she exports it, that projection will remain valid for the bounds um, of her data set. So you are not restricted. Um, and that is not a pro only feature either, but good question. Yes, very good question. Okay, so to finish exporting the file, I'll go ahead and click okay. And then I'm just gonna save it as however you want to name it. Let's see, we save this one as tree inventory. And this is going to export it as a Global Mapper mobile package file for me to send to Jeff. There are a few different ways to send it. It basically acts as a regular file. I can email it to him. I can Dropbox it to him. We could even take the GPS unit and plug it into your computer and um, export it to the device that way. And Jeff will look into this a little bit more in-depthly. Um, I'd also like to mention that it is possible to collect GPS data using Global Mapper Desktop. Um, there's a GPS option up here in the toolbar, and in version 23, there's even the new option to use an RTK with your desktop if you so chose. But because Global Mapper Desktop has a lot of hardware specifications that exceed what a usual, what a what a mobile device uses, and it's a little impractical to carry a large device out into the field, it's often much easier to export to Global Mapper Mobile and then re-import the finished collected GPS points later. So I've saved that file and I've sent it to Jeff, and let's see what that looks like in Global Mapper Mobile. 
Great, thanks, Amanda. Let me uh, take the screen back here, and then we'll start looking in mobile as I open the app at the same time. <clears throat> Where did I go? Okay. And hopefully now we are all seeing um, Global Mapper Mobile um, with my cursor moving on the screen. Um, so this is just the default home screen of the application. And we have a couple ways to think about how we want to get data into the app. Um, and that's important because that could vary very much depending on um, you know your workflows, how your organization shares data, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about a couple of those. So I could choose Open Map right from the main screen. Now this maps list would show um, any maps that you already have on your device. So right now I don't have any, so all I see is just the Getting Started map. I can access file locations directly in Global Mapper Mobile without having to leave the app. What this allows me to do is browse anywhere on my device where I may have um, shared file locations, right? So I happen to be on an iPad so I can see my iCloud drive, something I saved locally, or a variety of cloud-based options. Now, in this case, I have my um, Google Drive password locked. So that gives us a chance to look at opening data from another app and bringing it into um, Global Mapper Mobile that way. So from, in this case, my Drive app, but this would work the same whether we're talking about uh, an email app, you're opening an attachment, uh, Dropbox, or literally any other file sharing service. Choose the file in question, and I'm gonna choose to open it in. Um, and when it downloads, we'll open it in uh, Global Mapper Mobile. What that will do is kick us back over to Global Mapper Mobile and automatically open this um, GMMP and set it um, as my active map. Now, initially, this looks just like how um, Amanda had it set in desktop. So I can initially see um, the imagery layer she was working with, the roads and the tax parcels seem to have retained their styling too. I can check in my control center to verify the layers that I expect to be there are there. And that includes the tree inventory feature template layer. And we'll see right now it doesn't have any features in it. That is what um, we're going to work on updating now and then sending back to Amanda. You can view information for all of these layers just as you would in Global Mapper Desktop. So if you need to check the metadata for a certain data set or anything like that, all of that information um, is available to you. And you can, you know, you can move this control center around and place it wherever you need to um, while you are working. So as Amanda said, one of the main reasons we work in Global Mapper Mobile is to record location information um, in the field, right? Yes, you could certainly carry around your laptop and do this, um, but it becomes much easier, much more feasible to work with a phone or some other type of tablet device running iOS or Android um, to gather your data. A nice perk of this then is the ability to um, use either the device's location or what we're going to look at now, an external um, Bluetooth GPS device's location to base all of my feature creation. Maybe I'm, you know, trying to find a spot, some, some navigation and things like that. All of that based on one of those external devices. So I have my little shortcut sidebar open, but most of this functionality could also be accessed in the menu as well, just depending on how you want to interact with the app. What I'm going to do is choose the Bluetooth icon, and what that will do is show me any Bluetooth devices currently paired um, with my iPad. Now, now, I'm hoping to show um, the connection to some RTK devices, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to get both a good RTK signal and be inside at the same time. So we're just going to work with a standard um, non-RTK location device. Before I connect to that, we will though at least show that RTK setup information. 
So this here is a built-in Entrip client. It will allow you to connect to any host and any mount point to which um, you have access. So I very often, you know, use my state source um, or, you know, if somebody in the the company's testing in Maine, we use the main state source. Um, so there's plenty of free sources that are out there and provided that you can connect to um, and use to get your correction information if necessary. Anyway, I will connect to the, the GPS device that I have paired. We'll see I'm told my connection was a success and I don't have a pole height entered, but if I was using a survey pole, I could enter the height of that pole so that my elevation was adjusted for that value. Now, once my location is um, being read in from the, the GPS device, when I enable the display of my location, it'll tell me now that it is coming um, from that unit. I can see the details of that information as well. And, and this is often important to us to ensure we're getting the information we expect to be getting here. And so what we'll take a look at first is um, maybe our location info. So this comes directly to Global Mapper Mobile from the external unit via a NEMEA stream, and we'll look at that shortly. Um, I point that out because it's important for us to understand where this information is coming from, and that maybe when I don't have a certain set of information, right? So this device does not give me HRMS and VRMS uh, information, so Global Mapper can't display it. So what you see here will differ a little bit depending on the device you're using. You can also see a graphic of all the satellite constellations that you're working with. Um, you'll see a little legend telling you whether or not you have a fix. You can toggle um, constellations on and off. In this case, this unit only connects to GPS, but you have a variety of others available assuming um, your device connects to them. And then perhaps equally as important is the ability to view, um, record, and save the live NEMEA stream. Um, this is very often necessary to use as a reference. Um, especially if any of your work is, is survey grade or has legal implications, um, having that raw information from the device is important. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on too. Okay, so with my location enabled, my, my goal here now is to go out, gather some information um, and then send it back to Amanda in the office. What I would most realistically do um, in this process is I would find the, the trees that I need to record, and then I would use my location um, to record that information. Um, a variety of different ways to create features. Now, in this case, we're creating points, but um, this also applies to areas and line features as well. Um, I'm going to use the GPS tap in this case because I manually want the GPS recorded when I say so, right? I'm not walking a fixed distance or a fixed amount of time in this scenario, so that wouldn't be a proper way for me to want to record my data. Using the GPS tap option, when I tap anywhere on the screen, a point is going to be created exactly where my location is. So it doesn't matter where I tap, I now have a new feature to create. Uh, important to note, all of the information from the GPS is saved as part of the feature attribute. So you'll have reference information for that feature um, as its attribute information. And then we'll see down here the attributes that Amanda created as part of this feature template. Um, and this is an important step because me as the field user may not know that I have to populate all this information. And if I just go ahead and click OK, the app is going to prompt me and say, um, you need to fill this out. So select your options here, right? So what I'll do is I'll choose my tree species. It'll then kick me over and ask me for the heights. Uh, the tree is alive. Maybe it's DBH is 36 inches. Um, it is not a hazard. And feature creation is complete. Um, we can see in the control center, we now have um, one tree feature in our feature template layer. And here, let me turn off the display of my location for a second. And now we can see that that icon was also retained um, from the feature template as well. 
So a really um, useful way for me as the field user of the app to to know what to record and to have that kind of um, as a reference, right? Amanda ensured that I, I know and am recording the information that she needs. If, for example, I wanted to record a point at a location that maybe isn't GPS based, maybe I know this tree exists at this corner, I can simply tap there now I won't have any location information with this because I did this independent of the GPS, but I'll still by default be asked to put it in the same feature template. Again, uh, I'll be prompted to fill out the same set of attribute information. Um, maybe this tree is alive. It's a little larger than the other one, um, but in this case, let's say it is a hazard. Now, I have this point here and I can do a few things with it and I could have done this while I was creating it as well. But let's say I forgot to add some information to the point. I can select it and open its uh, feature info again. Now a couple things here I might want to do. I might want to add a picture of the tree. So maybe I use the camera on my device or maybe I already did so and I attach one um, from my library. I could attach a picture. I can also attach uh, a notation. So I could say tree is over wires or something like that. And so I save my note so that my, when I send it back to the office, Amanda will know um, what I did here. So if I had done anything, I could hit okay. In this case, I'm not gonna save those changes. I can just hit cancel. We You'll did see have a question. Sorry oh, to interrupt, but we did have a question come in. Sure. Someone wants to know if you're able to zoom in on the imagery. Oh yeah, good question. Yes, of course you can. Um, the only reason I hadn't was because um, I, I didn't really have a need to hear, but yes, yeah, so just pinching on the screen will zoom you in or out. So you'll see me pinching here. Um, you can also use, if you have your, your shortcut bar enabled, there's um, pan and zoom icons here if you prefer to use those icons rather than uh, pinching and zooming on the screen. Uh, you can also, if you want, maybe turn off the display of certain layers. So maybe my imagery is distracting, um, or I, I say, ah, you know what, I don't need my rows. You can you can turn that, those on and off just by by tapping on them here. Um, so good question. Uh, probably also worth mentioning, um, you don't necessarily have to send imagery to to the field user as part of your GMMP. Um, you do have the ability to connect to um, an online data layer. So for those of you who use Global Mapper Desktop, um, this is essentially the same as the online data tool. Um, the free version of Global Mapper Mobile has only one or two sources, but if you're a pro user, you'll have essentially the same set of sources that you have in Global Mapper Desktop. Um, caveat being there, that requires you to have a data connection so you can stream uh, the data into your application, um, whereas what Amanda sent me, right, other than loading the GMMP onto my device, I don't need a data connection because I can work with all that data local. So depending on your workflow, it might be more appropriate to connect to a few online data layers. What you're seeing on my map here is, is another thing that I wanted to point out. Um, I have an option configured uh, called distance and bearing. What that allows me to do is select any feature on the map. So I had selected this uh, tree feature that I created. And when I do that, I am given a distance and bearing value from my current location to that feature. So I might be navigating to something that I haven't seen before, or maybe I'm not working in a town and I'm out, um, you know, perhaps in the woods somewhere where I don't have trails and street signs to follow, but I know where I need to go. I can select the feature and navigate to it. So a really handy way to help us um, physically find our data or a certain location in the field um, while we are out there working. I can always you know, zoom back out here past the extent of my data and a click off the data clears that selection. So we had another data, okay. another question about Great. online imagery. 
he asked, if, when yeah. you use the online imagery layer, does it download just an area or does it stream it continuously? It will cache whatever you download at the extent when you connect. And then if you move or zoom or pan, it will reconnect or restream to um, update your view so that your view is always um, centered on where you are on the screen. What you can do also, kind of a little tangent to that, if you don't want that to happen, you can always um, save an online layer for offline use um, so that you don't always need to connect to the online source, but you have it saved in the app and can connect to it um, locally without that data connection. So that's another option as well, if you're concerned with, with the data stream or the data connection. So, at we this point, oh, another question? All right. So, yeah, we, while we're distracted here, yeah. um, someone wanted to know, I think you showed this earlier, but when you attach a picture, are you able to take a picture with the camera? And yep. um, So I could, let's go and edit a point here. Um, I could take the picture with the camera for, uh, right here or choose one from my library. I could also technically start by... Um, creating a picture point. So from the point creation menu, I could choose um, choosing a geotagged picture. So if I did this, it would open my photo library and I could grab and create a point based on that picture's location. Um, the reason I didn't do that here is I wanted to use my GPS location, which would be you know more accurate because the device is still just going to use its regular internal GPS for the picture location. We have no control over that. That's you know device specific. Um, so what I would do is if I'm using my GPS, external GPS, create the point and then attach a picture to it so that I have both the picture and the higher accuracy GPS location information. Any other questions, Amanda? We did have one more about feature templates. Are you able to rearrange um, the, the, the variables, alive or height? And you aren't able to in the Global Mapper mobile app, but you can specify that when you're creating the feature template in mobile map, Global Mapper desktop. Yep, great question. Uh, okay, so let's say um, as of now, I have um, I've finished up all my field work. I've gathered all my tree points. I need to think about um, sending this information back to Amanda, my data manager in the office. And maybe she has requested of me not only the updated data, but she also wants my um, NMEA stream. That's taking a second to load here. Let's go this way. I can choose to record the stream and maybe I would have started recording um, prior to going and recording my points, but I can record my live stream. That'll contain all my location information uh, in the raw NAMIA format. I can then stop recording and choose how I want to send it back to Amanda. So maybe I'll upload it to a shared drive we have or email it to her. Um, However, I choose to save it. I could I could save it locally into Global Mapper Mobile and share it later as well. In this case, I'm not going to save it and mail it to her, but I could and get her that specific location information. What I will do now, though, is save my map and then export it out so that Amanda can take a look at it back in the office to ensure that I did everything correctly. So before we export, we need to save our changes. Um, so I choose to save the map to a file. I could overwrite the existing, or maybe I'll save it as a new name. Um, if, for those of you who work with GeoPackage, um, Global Map or Mobile Pro can write to the GeoPackage format too, just another way to work with your data. Um, here are some options as to what data we're going to include. Um, I believe this is default now, but maybe I say, oh, I don't need to send Amanda the raster data. She doesn't care about that. I could uncheck that. So then all I'll do is give it a new name. Maybe I'll call it edited and hit OK. Now I'll be asked if I want to work in that saved workspace because initially I'm still in the, in the GMMP that Amanda sent me. So I'll say yes. This will then load uh, the GMMP with all those saved um, edits that I have in the field. We can see those two uh, tree points that I created. 
and then I'll just go ahead and export. Uh, I can either email it or upload it to a file location uh, and send it off to Amanda. One other thing I'll note, um, from the open map file list, you also have the ability to share here. So you don't necessarily have to open the, the GMMP to send it. Maybe you did all your work in the field, saved it, and then when you get back to your hotel or your office or wherever you have service, you can then go ahead and share the file right from there along with you know, deleting it, renaming it, whatever you need to do. So at that point, this file is off to Amanda and we'll have her take a look at it and see how my work um, in the field went. So Amanda, I will give you the screen now. All right, we did have a question come in. Can sure. the office manager see the data being collected in the field in real time as it's being collected? Ah, good question. But do you want to answer that, Amanda? Yeah, <laughs> the answer, un unfortunately, unless you're seeing their screen like we're seeing Jeff's is no. The, the only way to get the data back to the data manager is to send it as a file. So you should be able to see Global Mapper right here, and I have the file that Jeff sent me, and I'm just going to drag and drop it in. Easy peasy, just like a regular file. It gives you the option to, to just load a few of the layers if you want to. If you were loading in a lot of um, package files from a, few, a, a crew of field workers, then maybe you would only want to load the points, but we can go ahead and load all of them just to see how that looks in Global Mapper. And we can see here the tree point that Jeff collected. And if we look at the template layers, we can open the attribute editor and see the information that he collected. Now you'll notice that not only is the information there that we added as part of the feature template, but also there's additional location information that was added by the GPS unit. This is a bit wider than my screen, so I'll shrink this down a little bit. But you can see that it gave an altitude or an elevation measurement, and it gave a timestamp information and differential GPS fix. All the information that was provided by the GPS is saved per point. Yep, and you could, if you needed to, um, this may be a scenario where if I had also sent Amanda the um, Nemea stream, she could she could verify that against, um, you know, the point attribute information if that was necessary for, you know, whatever workflow she was um, trying to accomplish. Exactly. But I think that pretty much wraps us up for today. Um, as we're getting towards the end of the hour here. Do we have any other questions that came in, Amanda? It I think was... we answered a lot of these. Um, someone wanted to know if we could use Microsoft Teams earlier to transfer files, and um, there's no there's no real limit on how to transfer the file from your computer to your mobile device. It just, as I said earlier, it just, just acts as a regular file. Whatever you can open on your device is solid. Yep. Um, let's see here. It looks like we may have one other question. Let's see if I can get this full screen enough so I can read it um, before we wrap up here. Uh, this says if you had. Uh, if you attach some photos to a feature in the field, are they also sent to the office? Um, yes, that would be retained with the point feature so that. Um, you know, if I had done that here, Amanda would have seen that point associated with um, the tree feature there as well. And then we had another good question about the NMEA data. So what would that look like back at the office and how would that typically be used? Um, so the, the NMEA data would be saved essentially to a text file and it would look like a static version of that scrolling text screen um, that I showed in the app. Normally that is used as a reference when you know maybe someone is um, marking property boundaries or you know surveying a construction site where um, if anything needs to be recorded legally they can say okay my raw data from my GPS says I was at this location um, with this accuracy information, this elevation value, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's really more of a way to have some, not quite metadata, but detailed information if it's needed. Um, certainly not a um, incredibly common workflow, but one that's worth noting if we're talking about, you know, saving and managing our data in workflows like this. 
We did have another question come in while we have time. Can you use Spike to measure vertical surfaces? And yeah, in the one of the newer releases of Global Mapper Mobile, we have the ability to use a to add spike and dip points to measure the vertical surfaces. Uh, and that data. Am I right? Am I getting ahead of myself with version release? I think I'm not quite sure what I think you're thinking of strike and dip points, which yes, can be recorded. I'm not sure if if spike David is perhaps something that term we're not familiar with. Um, so we can shoot you an email and follow up with you on that one. But I think um, that about wraps us up. Uh, I do see, David, that link you sent us. We'll take a look at that. Um, please feel free. Let me uh, start sharing my screen here one last time. Um, So please um, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, the first email address there is our sales uh, department and the second one is our technical support department. So if you would like to try out um, either Global Mapper Mobile or perhaps you're a new Global Mapper desktop user, you can download free trials. Um, Global Mapper Mobile is available on iOS and Android and their respective app stores and Global Mapper Desktop can be downloaded right from our website, uh, bluemarblegeo.com. So thank you everyone um, for your patience with our audio issues early on. I hope you in, enjoyed this session uh, and Amanda, thanks for joining me and all your help. Of course, have a great day everyone. Take care.